Welcome to Go Linhas Aéreas conference call to discuss the third quarter 2023 results. This morning, the company released its results. After Go presentation, we'll begin the question and answer section, initially for analysts and investors, followed by the journalists present, at which time further instructions will be provided. This event is being broadcast via Zoom and can be accessed on the company's website in bowiegocombr slash ri. We informed you that all participants will only be listening to the event during the presentation, and then the participants will also be able to send their questions on the platform and they will be answered by the management during this conference call or by Go's investor relations team after the end of the conference call. From now on, participants are already free to submit questions through the Zoom platform. All you have to do is click on the Q&A button located in the bottom bar of your screen and type your question. Before proceeding, I would like to emphasize that the forward-looking statements are based on the beliefs and assumptions of the company's management and the current information available to the goal. These statements may involve risks and uncertainties as they relate to future events and therefore depends on circumstances that may or may not occur. Investors, analysts and journalists should take into account that events related to the macroeconomic environment, the segment and other factors could cause results to differ maturely from those expressed in the respective forward-looking statements. Now, I give the floor to Mr. Ferrer. Please, Mr. Ferrer, you may begin your conference. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your availability today on our earnings call. This morning, we published our third quarter earnings release and a presentation on GO's investor relation website. So we will just make a few brief comments here and get straight to your questions. The third quarter was another solid milestone to demonstrate that GO's strategy and execution in adding profitable growth is generating consistent results as we expected. This has been achieved by the trust we have obtained from our customers, investors, suppliers, lessors, and in particular, our team, who have done an impressive job and whose dedication has been the key factor that continues to drive us in this space of recovery. Between July and September, Go transported more than 8 million passengers in more than 57,000 departures. This represents a year-over-year -year increase of 16% and 13% respectively. We continue to launch and inaugurate new bases in the regional market, such as cities at Uberaba in Minas Gerais and Aracatuba in Sao Paulo. In the international markets, we increase our ASK supply by 5%, mainly in South American markets compared to the third quarter of 2022. We continue on our disciplined path to profitable capacity recovery. As can be seen, the 2.4 percentage points increase in our load factor, while our aircraft utilization rate increased by 2% to 11.3 hours per day. Yield grew 4.5% in the period, while our PRASC is up by 7.6% and our RASC increased 10.7%. This demonstrates the potential we have been achieving through the initiatives to diversify other revenues with SMILES and GoLog businesses. The first, SMILES, which has a direct relationship with the perception of a better flight experience, expanded its customer base by more than 80% year over year and reached more than 1 billion highs in revenue. Our GoLog cargo unit more than doubled its revenue, even with our organic capacity still constrained by the slower pace supply of our passenger aircraft fleet. We have further expanded, expanded our partnership with Mercado Livre, which has already provided GoLog with a leadership in cargo volume shares in tons per kilometer. And we have been exploring new opportunities for cargo synergies between the dedicated fleet of freighters and the space in the cargo belly of the GoLog aircraft. In addition, this partnership has the option to expand up to six more incremental aircraft, reaching a fleet of up to 12 aircraft in the coming years. This quarter, we also maintain the growth pace of our tour operator, Smiles Viagens. Launched last quarter, 
which at this moment, in addition to expanding its portfolio of products and partnership, has also been expanding directly negotiations with hotels, which already add up to more than 800 distribution agents in the Brazilian and international segments. Combined, other revenues represents a 65% year-over-year -year increase to 413 million reais. For another consecutive quarter, we achieve a record revenues for a third quarter of 4.7 billion reais, with an EBIT operating margin of 17.7%, an increase of more than 11 percentage points compared to the previous years, position go among the companies with the best operating performance in the sector. The attractiveness of our network and positioning in, man, in the main markets of high traffic and demand for leisure and business segments has been the main differentiator for our revenue performance. As corporate demand speaks up, the number of takeoffs has increased by 13% with a reduction in the average tent length of 7.5% and which has uh, an impact on our cost. Our cost, cost sorry, our CASCAX fee for passenger op operation increased 4.9% comparing to third quarter 2022, mainly due to return of four aircraft this quarter and lower dilution of our fixed costs that are still impacted by a number of non-operating aircraft that remain temporarily and in our fleet. Without the aircraft returns in, the, in this quarter, our CASCAX fuel would represent stability in the same comparison. Even so, we managed through our discipline capacity management to preserve profitability with yields that also increase in the same proportion with higher occupancy rates, which grew 2.4 points compared to the previous year. While our ASK is increased by 5.2% compared to last year. They are still 19.3% lower compared to third quarter 2019. In terms of operating fleet, we operated 108 aircraft in the third quarter 2023, while in the third quarter in 2019, we had 115 operation aircraft, seven more than this quarter. We are committed to increase the productivity of our fleet while we operate with temporarily low capacity and to incur in higher, higher costs for returning non-operating aircraft. We expect a, transit a, a transitory impact of our ex fuel costs to the levels higher than 2019 levels. We are focused on resuming capacity discipline. The right sizing of our fleet will allow Go to deliver even higher levels of profitability and to optimize its low cost business model supported by higher aircraft utilization. We believe this is an opportunity to upside in cost efficiencies that does not exist for our competitors who are already pushing to the upper end of their historical fleet utilization. The industry has been impacted by uncertainties in the schedule of deliveries of new aircrafts by manufacturers. In our case, of a total of 15 aircraft schedule for the year of 2023, Go has so far added only one new 737 MAX 8 aircraft to our passenger fleet. On another side, as part of our fleet renewal plan and recovery of our productivity and operation efficiency, we returned four 737 NGs aircraft in this quarter and seven since the beginning of the year. We will continue with the plan to replace NGs with MAX over the next few quarters. As part of the exclusive agreement with Mercado Livre for cargo transportation, we received the fifth 737-800 BCF aircraft this quarter. And in the month of October, we received the sixth freighter aircraft completing the commitment of six aircraft for the year 2023. We have invested in improving our digital channels, which have reached the highest level of self-services. As capacity increases, our fleet returns to, to 2019 levels. We believe that our dedication to cost efficiency and our team's commitment to provide the best customer experience will reinforce Go's already consolidated competitive position in the market. In terms of discipline and commitment to executed by the Go team, 
we will continue on the right track with our plans to continue to be the benchmark for the lowest unit cost in the region. Excluding the effects of the, free, the, the freighted fleet, our total unit cost decreased by 9.5% comparing to last year. The consistent results we have presented in recent quarters are important for a recovery in our cash flow from operating activities, which reached 0.9 billion reais in the quarter. Finally, we would also like to highlight that this October, we renew for another 10 years our exclusive commercial agreement with our friends KLM, which represents the expansion of the code share that will provide better connectivity to more than 125 destinations in Europe and Brazil, and also in the future, new destinations through Latin America. This strengthening of the partnership also provides for the enhancement of joint sales and more benefits for customers of Goes Miles and Air France KLM's Flying Blue loyalty programs, as well an, an expansion of the Air France KLM workshop existing engine maintenance support for Goes CFM 56 and LEAP engines. We are sure that the sum of the initiatives we have taken to increase our productivity will be fundamental to take go to a new level in the coming months. I will now turn the floor to Mario, who will represent some other highlights. Thanks, also. Uh, I want first to start to thank our entire Go team for this very incredible hard work and dedication during this quarter. They have been doing excellent and entirely work to improve our operational efficiency and our client's experience. It has been reflected in the achievement of record net revenue in this Q3 and consistency of margins quarter over quarter, and even the EBIT and the beach, the margins reaching a strong uh, levels of 17.7% and 26.8% 20, respectively. Our beach that for the quarter was 1.25 billion reais, while our operating profit was 825 million reais. Our yield and RASC also reached record levels, growing 4.5% and 10.7% respectively to 47 and 43 cents of real. We reached 5.4 billion reais in sales volume this quarter, demonstrating that future booking curves remain strong and with continuously high load factors. Our demand in the domestic market continues to grow consistently and resiliently. We had the best August ever, according to ANAC, uh, with 8.2 million passengers supporting Brazil. In addition, business travel saw also 17.3% increase compared to the previous quarter and continues to improve uh, consistently as companies uh, continue to, to show return to office initiatives. With a comprehensive and proven business strategy, together with the most qualified team in the industry, we have created a healthy combination of capacity recovery and yield growth. Our total unit cost uh, was decreased by approximately 8% year over year, helped by the decrease in the jet fuel prices during this quarter. We are committed to continue to deliver the best cost performance in the industry. We also, this quarter, we completed two major liability management transactions. Uh, the first one was related to the refinancing of uh, 1 billion rice the bantries uh, with the Brazilian local banks, which resulted in a 30 months uh, extension uh, as the new term now is June 26. And we have the support of those local debenture banks in allowing us to a better adjustment of the debt to the goals current cash flow, cash flow. The second was the completion of the conversion of uh, $1.2 billion of uh, SSNs, uh, senior secure notes, into a convertible debt instrument, the ESSN, maturing in 2028. So no, no change in terms of the, the terms and conditions of the SSN. In the middle of this process, a total of 992 million of goals uh, warrants uh, has been subscribed and has been issued, which may be converted into shares in the future 
at an exercise price of 5.82 uh, reais per share, which would result in a performa view in a reduction of approximately 6 billion reais in gold's total indebtedness, the total leverage. Strengthen, strengthening our balance sheet remains a top priority. Our fundamentals continue to improve as we reduce our leverage to four times as of uh, September 30 of this year, this third quarter, from 9.5 times uh, by the end of last year. So it's uh, almost five times uh, reduction in terms of leverage, mainly impacted or contributed by the recovery in our EBITDA uh, and the reduction of net debt in this period. To conclude my highlights, and in order to provide the usual transparency to our investors, we are predating our financial outlook for this year, 2023, uh, reflecting uh, the nine months uh, uh, results uh, that has been already uh, delivered with a more challenging scenario for fuel costs for, for Q23 that practically offset the benefit generating uh, fru frugout uh, uh, the second quarter 23 mostly and also the impacts on capacity derived from the current uncertainty in our fleet plan that generate a lower dilution in our fixed costs especially on the cast XU impact for the for, for Q23 now I return the floor to Celso thank you Mario we will maintain our dedication to initiatives that promote a broader diversification of revenue sources and, above all, those that lead to improvements in productivity and efficiency. Our operation continues to build on the solid foundations we have established in the recent years and our commitment to provide reliability, profitability and strengthening our balance sheet. Our business model has proven to be robust with a strong track records of execution and industry leadership. We are confident in our ability to deliver significant improvements, particularly in capturing upsides for reduction of our XFIO cask. So to conclude, I would like to thank our Eagles team for the new record on revenues, the higher margins and the excellent experience they provide daily to our customers. I'm extremely proud of this team's roles in rebuilding the best performing airline in the region. Their dedication is what continues to prop us to the top. Carrier, you can start the Q&A question. Thank you. The conference call is now open for questions, initially only from analysts and investors. At the end of this stage, we will open for questions from the journalists present. Therefore, if analysts or investors have a question, please click on the raise hand button located in the bottom bar of your Zoom screen now or at any time after this announcement. If at any point your question has already been answered before your turn comes, press the lower hand key to get out of the queue. We we'll ask that when you ask your question, speak close to the receiver of the device so that everyone can hear you clearly. Participants can also submit written questions throughout the platform, clicking on the Q&A button located in the bottom bar of your Zoom screen and then type in your question. Please wait while we receive the questions from investors and analysts. Our first question comes from Savi Syed from Raymond James. Please, Mr. Safi, your microphone's open. Thank you and, and good morning. Um, just on the uh, utilization front, uh, you know, given that there's so much opportunity there, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, the biggest impediments to getting that utilization back to 12 hours and, and you know, your kind of visibility on, on how you get there. Hi, Savi. Good morning. It's Celso. Thank you for your question. And uh, as you know, we are working hard to to achieve, let's say, the, the, the numbers that we are 
uh, we used to fly uh, to 12 hours per day. And we are almost there with the existing fleet. Uh, we still have some planes, uh, more planes that we normally have in maintenance lines. We, we used to have four maintenance lines. Now we have up to eight, depending on the quarter. And so this is, this is one of the, the hurdles we are facing. As well, we are, we are now focused in this quarter, specifically the third quarter, is where we reduce the stent length. We concentrate a lot of the operation in the short haul to make sure we would be able to to fly the the customer the the corporate customers traffic but as we go to the fourth quarter we start to increase the the red eye flights increase the stench length and especially now with the changes in Santos Dumont to Galeão that we are anticipating even though we need to change in January but we are anticipating to November December we we want to increase uh, the utilization of those planes to, for above 14 hours, which will drive our average to the the, the 12 hours that you're mentioning. That, that makes sense. And that explains why the ASKs are increased, uh, kind of unchanged there. Uh, if I might, just on your uh, partnership with uh, Air France KLM, is there a significant changes uh, from the agreement that was there before and and or tied to that like what happens to some of the partnerships that you had to europe such as uh, with tap does that kind of get excluded with the new partnership no we are not we are not explaining any additional curve out of what we already have i mean what we have with uh, uh, france klm is very special we have been building uh long-term projects together it's not only a code share we are uh, working for them to develop new gateways in brazil also making sure that we provide more connectivity now in Rio, we are, we are reinforcing this by growing the the, the beyonds in, in Rio International. Uh, one of the main difference, uh, it's not on the commercial passenger side, it's more on the, on the MRO side that we increase, let's say our contract with them for the next, uh, next years to have more slots and also give access to, uh, maintenance for our NG, CFM 56 engines, and also the LEAP. I think that's the that's the, a big change that we, we come in a good time for us. That's helpful. So, so no kind of change to your other partnerships that are existing? Not. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Daniel McKenzie from Seaport Global. Please, Mr. Daniel, your microphone's open. Oh, hey, good morning. Thanks, guys. Can you hear, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, just following up on Savi's question here, if we're just kind of to, to approach that from a different perspective, what percent of the cask X fuel eventually goes away when the structural overhead that you're carrying today normalizes? So, for example, the excess pilots versus what you can fly, the eight lines of maintenance that, you know, eventually would potentially get to four. Um, and then if you could just uh, clarify, you know, sort of a timeline for when you might think this could normalize. Is it sometime in 2024 or is it more realistic to assume that it's probably going to be closer to 2025 sometime? Hi, Dan. Good morning. Uh, very good question. And as I was explaining uh, here this morning, we expect to have a higher uh, cost X fuel for temporarily and to address, I mean, all the fleet constraints we have on the, on the engine side, but also on the delivery side and primarily on the delivery side. Like you saw, we, we took delivered of one max out of the 15 and we may take. Hello? Hi, Dan. Ah, so, okay. I, I think we, we, we had a problem with our connection. Ah, I can Hi, hear Dan. you now. Yeah, I can hear you now. Can Terrific. you hear me now? So, sorry, uh, we, we had a problem with my connection here. And okay. so, so, as, as, a, as an explain in, the, in, in my first comments here, we are going to to face a temporary increase in our cask X fuel uh, for at least 12 months. So we expect to to reach the the level of productivity is only by half of next year. 
Mm. We, we are, as you said, we have this drag of fixed cost, which is not related to crew, because in, in Brazil we have a variable uh, payment uh, and we have a, a good agreement with our crew, so we, we can fly more or, fr or fly a little bit less, not too much less like in the pandemic, but we can fly a little bit less with, uh, with our crew and we can accommodate this, this, this situation for, let's say, six to nine months. We, we expect to have, let's say, the, the right a ASK's production with our existing fleet by, by third quarter next year with the same levels of cost X field that we have in 2019. It's not only on the cask that you see the inefficiency, it's also on the lease payments. So if you look at the lease payments, we still have 20 aircraft on the ground. This is the, the, the biggest drag that we have at, uh, at this moment. Mm. Yeah, and, very and, good. And, and let, let, me, let me add one point as well. Um, you know, because of that, uh, you know, constraints related to capacity, uh, if you look to what we've been doing, especially in order to recover the efficiency of our fleet, we are, returning more uh, a higher number of aircraft in order to reduce uh, that level of uh, let's say aircraft that is currently not, not under operation so uh, this number came from something around 30 to 40 aircraft uh, since by the end of pandemic and now is a uh, is a number that is uh, uh, you know lower than 20 but it's still as as mentioned said uh, you know we have some inefficiency on the cash flow because we are paying some of the leases that is either is not produ producing uh, uh, profit, right? So th that is something that we are planning to uh, be able to reduce, uh, you know, until the end of next year. Uh, mm -hmm. Potential is not going to be producing, uh, let's say, all the revenue profitability already within the next year, but definitely is going to be preparing the company for, uh, you know, Entering 2025 uh, without yeah. any leakage on that, and uh, the, the 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 constraint on the fleet as well is that uh, you know we are uh, probably going to be impacted by temporary unit cost that's going to be a little bit higher, given the 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 you know the the cost associated to return on the on on the aircraft, and at the same time we we are not extracting uh, you know gains for for potential new deliveries that we used to have. Uh, if we receive all the deliveries according to the original plan, so uh, basically we have been been very committed to drive uh, the the unit cost, the cask XU uh, in US dollars to a similar level to 2019. Uh, really? If you look to this quarter, you know maybe it's about uh, 0.5 cents in US dollar of cask XU that is deviated mostly mm -hmm. related to that capacity constraint. Uh, if you remember in the first uh, guidance that we provided, we're expecting to increase much more towards to 15 to 20% of SK this, this, uh, this year. And now, now we are reducing to maybe a low end of, uh, you know, low, low double digit area. Uh, so that's, of course, that impacts uh, you know, most of that cost because there's some limitation on what we can do in terms of reducing the fixed cost. Uh, and and given the certainty, of course, this is structural overhead is something that's temporarily, but uh, is is that those there's no a lot of room to reduce until we have a more clear view of what's going to be happen in the future. And uh, if you look to the baseline, the company is generating, uh, you know, a healthy profit, uh, a healthy business. So it means that uh, for every aircraft that we're going to be adding uh, back uh, to the operation, uh, we're going to be creating additional business, additional cash flow that can help, uh, of course, the the next coming year cash flow in order to address higher capex going forward. Mm, yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, and just, you know, following up on that last point, Mario, you know, for 20, as we think about 2024, and as we think about some of these structural costs going away, what is the level of EBITDA 
next year that gets you to say free cash flow break even just based on the capex that you're looking at. So I'm I'm not asking for a forecast. I'm just trying to get a sense of the hurdle rate for generating cash next year. And then, you know, just kind of as a follow on to that, you know, to what extent is goals loyalty program unencumbered currently and and could it be used as a source of uh, refinancing future debt that comes due in in 2025? Sure. Uh, for, for your first question, uh, if you look this year, uh, even with the, the, the beta margin that we're providing, uh, NoGo is reaching uh, a neutral cash flow for the ongoing operations. So for the current obligation, uh, we, we can we can uh, cover not only uh, all the necessity related to the PNL, uh, but also uh, the capex for the ongoing operation. Of course. Uh, one of the main challenges right, right now is how we can uh, address the, the balance sheet issues, right? And also the capex that has been uh, remained from the previous years. Uh, so uh, some of the engines that you need to cover also this uh, lack of new aircraft, uh, you know, that was was going to be supposed to be delivered. That that's the the impact on the cash flow uh, and. The main problem, uh, especially in this year, was uh, not the level of what gold can generate in terms of EBITDA, but also, uh, you know, the lack of uh, of credit availability, especially during the first half of the year. Uh, that is, is something that we are working in order to establish that credit capacity, especially for the capex that has been one of the import sources that we have been able to, uh, you know, create uh, as as uh, uh you know financing support in, in the previous year so so uh, the the point is that you know going forward uh if you can consider that you know the the recovering capacity can help the company in order to start to dilute uh fix the cost and also to drive the cash fuel fuel uh, going down and at the same time the market is still very aligned in terms of the discipline of uh, continue to keep uh, yields and fares in a sustainable way, uh, that's going to be a natural expansion in terms of EBITDA. Uh, if you look prior to 2018, it was, uh, you know, a, a number that's much closer to, to 29 to 30%. So we don't expect that the debt recovery is going to be taken so fast. So maybe one percentage point, uh, you know, every single year is something that is reasonable if you think that we can act capacity in conjunction to huge preservation going forward and that definitely uh you know if we resolve that uh about uh 15 to 20 idle aircraft in our fleet and put that back in operation producing that a beach the level that it has been healthy uh definitely that this can add as additional source in order to handle the capex going forward Mm, yeah. If I just squeeze one last quick one in here, the, the 15 maxes uh, that were planned for this year, the final expectation for 2023, if you could just remind us, and are those all going to get bunched into 2024 or are there additional discussions with Boeing at this point for either additional compensation or for a, you know, kind of a repacing uh, of the order book? Yeah. Uh, hey, Dan, sorry, I, I, I was answering your question and I had a connectivity problem. I was answering oh. exactly this, and oh. Oh, yeah. and we had we took delivery of one plane, and we expect to take delivery of at least additional four until the end of the year. That's what we we are working really close to Boeing now. To it's like a, a kind of a uh, ev almost every day call to make sure that we take uh, this capacity, which is now a little bit to the right of what we uh, were expecting on the fourth quarter. And w w our main discussion today is how can we uh, make sure that we, I mean, we catch up uh, as as soon as possible next year uh, on the uh, on the delivers because today the max the, the best case scenario today is to take five out of fifteen, so we need the extra ten uh, sooner than later at the beginning of the year, and this is what we are discussing with Dan. No answer yet. Mm, okay. Thanks for the time, you guys. Thank you. Our next question comes from João Frizo from Goldman Sachs. Please, Mr. João, 
your microphone's open. Yes, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking my questions. Uh, I have two from our side. Uh, the first one relates to the guidance you guys updated. So uh, we were just wondering if you could help us reconcile the downward revision in net revenue guidance. Uh, if you were to take into account your capacity guidance for the year and your new net new net revenue guidance, uh, this implies on a deterioration uh, quarter over quarter in ROSC in 4Q. So I'm just trying to understand to what do, to what do you attribute this this worsening. Uh, and the second question is related to the to the new exchangeable senior convertible notes. Uh, if you could just help us with the calculations. Uh, to the 3.9 billion you guys uh, recognize it as a derivative uh, liability. Uh, thank you very much. Those are two, my two questions. Sure. Uh, so th thanks, uh, John. So the first one, uh, let, let me answer first the, the exchangeable first. So we, this quarter, we we issued the ESSN, right? Uh, that it converted uh, about $1.2 billion uh, dollars of, from the previous SSN. Uh, and if you look to the financial statements, we still have some portion around $100 million of SSN that has still not been converted and is still sitting in, in the balance sheet. So you still have the, those two instruments in, in, the, in the balance sheet, but uh, uh, the, the major portion of the, the SSN has been already converted. And uh, we followed by the IFRS accounting rule uh, by uh, converting into a SSN that is uh, a convertible instrument, uh, we need to split out two components. So first is a debt portion. Uh, this, what is going to be the fair value of the, the debt portion? And the second is uh, to value what is going to be the implicit option, the embedded option, because this is a conversion, convertible instrument uh, that's going to be split in a different line of the balance sheet. So uh, you, you, you see that in the loans and financings, uh, you know, the original SSN now is recorded 3.4 billion reais, so it's about $680 million. And uh, the separate component that's related to that derivatives is splitting in another line. Uh, so we are just following what is required in terms of accounting rule because uh, this is kind of a convertible instrument. And of course, by the end of the material of conversion or or even in the material of this debt, uh, the lender, uh, the Zabra, will continue to collect the same 1.2 billion. So, but the books tended to reflect the time value for this option feature. So if you add the two components in aggregate, uh, you know, it's probably going to take the, the same amount. Uh, and this fair value of the auction will be value each quarter. Uh, but that's already reflect uh, kind of a derivative instrument that, that go against the equity. Uh, that's why it's not considered as a debt anymore. That answer your, 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 this last question for you? Yes, super mm -hmm. clear. Okay. Um, and the second was related to the guidance, right? So uh, if you look to what we we did is specifically, everything was was correlated to the fact that we reduce uh, the number of operating fleet, uh, and that was a result of uh, that impact that we we answered in the previous questions related to the lower. Uh, uh, number of uh, max to be delivered. At the same time, we are still keeping, uh, uh, you know, the same rate of redeliveries. Uh, that that's one of the main efforts that we are implementing in order to reduce that that gap if, between the total fleet and the operating fleet. So uh, the reduction in terms of new deliveries uh, has been reducing uh, the number of uh, uh, SKs. Actually, the SKs didn't change, but because we were uh, in the middle end of SK, now we're moving much more into low end, but uh, you can see that in terms of seats and also departures, we were in the low end and, and, and now we reduce uh, that guidance related to seats. Uh, so uh, we are considering less departures and of course uh, that is being, impacting uh, a, a lower number of uh, revenue. Uh, you mentioned about ROSC. We expect that the yield is going to be more 
stable, but at the same time, risk that is related to uh, the contribution from loyalty and also from cargo, especially cargo because of the reduction in terms of the SKs, or, so the capacity on, on the belly of the aircraft is also going to be impacted. And if you look to uh, especially the, the revenue uh, performance for this quarter, uh, even though yields has been increased by 4.5% uh, year over year, the ROSC increased about 11% and has been mainly driven by the city revenues that that potential impact in terms of capacity will be also lower uh, the contribution on the ROSC coming from city revenues going forward. And that's why you have a lower revenue, uh, you know, implicit in the guidance. Thank you very much, you guys. Super clear. And just if I may, just a follow up on the secured notes. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you guys have not drawn everything you could draw uh, from the $450 million uh, in cash you could do. Uh, could you just update us on how much have you guys already withdrawn with the SSN and how much is left? Thank you. Yeah, until the second quarter was around $200 uh, million uh, that has been drawn. That's why we converted uh, from the up to $1.4 uh, uh, billion of uh, the SSN. We have been converting something about $1.2. Uh, in this quarter, we utilize it uh, primarily for the, the CapEx essential activities like acquisition of spare parts, uh, something additional $50 million uh, roughly. Super clear. Thanks very much, guys. Our next question comes from Victor Mizuzaki from Bradesco BBI. Please, Mr. Victor, your microphone's open. Hi, uh, I have uh, two questions here. Uh, the, the first one uh, you mentioned in, in the presentation that you have uh, six options for uh, cargo freighters uh, for 2024. So, so my first question is, uh, what will make you exercise these options? I mean, can we assume that maybe you can announce a, a big contract maybe in Q4 or early next year to trigger these options? And uh, the, the second one is related to the leasing contracts. Uh, in the income statement, I think that you booked like uh, 60 million reais uh, of gains with uh, leasing negotiations. So can you give additional details about these? Thank you. Hi Victor, good good morning. So on the on the cargo on the cargo options that we have, we are the the first commitment was the six uh, aircraft, and the the number six is now uh, arrived in uh, in October, and from the seventh to the twelfth we go one by one. We don't need to go like to an additional six. And this is what we are working uh, close to the to Mercado Livre to understand the, the demand environment. And of course, they, they do their forecast. And we, we are working to make sure that until the end of this year, we have a clear picture because we need to commit uh, well in advance with those planes. So we are working with Lessors, well, especially on our uh, returns. If we can combine a lease return that we have on our existing passenger fleet to a conversion into cargo, that's that's the best thing uh, for us and for Mercado Livre. And this is what we did, by the way, in the in the six airplanes that we have. So we are discussing right now with the lessors those options to make sure that we can start receiving those planes by second uh, second quarter next year. We go one by one. I'm sure it's going to be more than six. But it's still early to say uh, how, how many out of the twelve that we have. And on the on the second questions that that, that you raised, uh, the the gains was related to sales backs that we did on the engines and also in in the one of the maxes that we received. So we used to have finance uh, leases on some engines that we turn into operating leases uh, during the quarter. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jay Sang from City. Please, Mr. Jay, your microphone's open. 
Hey, um, you guys have already answered one of my questions, but the other one I wanted to ask is what sort of flow are you seeing from American Airlines? Okay, good morning, Jay. Uh, we, we, we are, I mean, constantly uh, reviewing how can we improve the partnership with America uh, that has been very strong since we, we, we signed that deal. And we we are happy that America has now increased the capacity to Brazil. So especially we we have been feeding them a, a lot from Guarulhos, which is the main gateway. But we didn't have a, a, a great network so far in Rio International. And from this winter season and on, we are going to provide, uh, uh, let's say, a sizable uh, beyond points from Rio International, and I'm sure the, that we will be contributing a lot to to the American airline flights in Brazil, and and they will probably stay with one, one, their flights for in the future. They have seasonal flights, and for now, and I'm sure they will they, they will be seeing a lot of traffic going from from Go. We we have with them the highest uh contribution that we already have with uh, a partner in this corridor which is more than 35 percent connectivity in most of the flights so it's pretty strong it's pretty strong also on the frequent flyer and both frequent flyers our customers are now really understanding the partnership and flying with us flying with them a advantages miles and so uh, we we foresee that the flows will 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 continue to increase during next year that's super helpful. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, j just before the parader, uh, going back to the to the other uh, uh, South analysts that wanted to have a question, we received some questions on the webcast platform, so I I will be handle uh some some of those questions. So first one was coming from Matt from from one of our investors. Uh. Uh, can you discuss the youth environment and the competitive landscape? So I, I would defer to Celsius to respond that one. Yeah, thank you, Mario. And uh, I think uh, all, all the industry now has some sort of uh, hurdle in to grow capacity, uh, no matter the fleet. And in our case, uh, we, we mentioned a lot of the, the, the constraints we have right now. And we are facing a very rational environment in terms of yield, yield and how the industry is be, behaving. We expect the yields to stay uh, at, at this level. We don't, of course, we, it's not our goal to, to increase fares. We want to uh, grow uh, again, bring back planes back to the operation, be more productive with the fleet and be, give people better access to better fares. That's what we want. But we see that, especially in the next quarters, a very stable environment in the yields and a very rational industry uh, and potentially for the first time in, in many, many years in Brazil, and not only in Brazil, but also in the region. As we are expanding international, we are also seeing healthy yields uh, on the regional international flights uh, that, that we do. Yeah, and uh, there's also another question uh, from the webcast platform on uh, can, can you give us some details about the fuel cost hedge and what is the percentage of uh, expected use uh, that is hedged? So we we generally has a more concentration of hedge uh, during the, the short term. Uh, so we have for the next two quarters for, for Q and, and first Q, something around 30 to 40 percent uh hedge ratio uh that of course uh you know hedge activities right now has been something uh especially here for for the brazilian airlines that is uh more costly so uh we have been focusing much more in terms of the the cash usage to to the capex and to return uh, you know the essential investments and we have been trying to uh, select uh, a most costless instruments that can uh, create some protection for the company, especially in this kind of a very volatile environment where we envision uh, definitely uh, for the fourth quarter, 
And that's one of the reasons why we kept the guidance for jet fuel per liter and change, even though we have some um, benefit during the second and the third quarter, but we started to see, uh, you know, the prices on jet fuel for the fourth quarter. So beginning of fourth quarter and now October uh, to st stay higher than what is the level they produce. So ultimately that most of the benefits on, on the first, uh, let's say six months pr prior to this quarter, uh, is going to be somehow compensated, offset uh, by, uh, you know, more upside risk on the oil price going forward. But so, but we, we have this strong yield environment, uh, uh, very disciplined in terms of the competitors uh, that uh, somehow, you know, creates a, a lower pressure to being so much hedged. Uh, but we, we are much more concentrated in the next six six months. And that there's also one question uh, that came from uh, Deutsch as our sell side. Uh, he's putting here in the webcast and also uh, getting back to sales as well. Uh, with exclusivity with Fair France KLM, what does that mean for historical frequent flyer uh, program tied with TAP Air Portugal? Does that no longer exist? Thank you, Hilary, for your question. And uh, as I said, no changes in the in the TAP agreements, Air Portugal, that we have today. We we TAP is a great partner. They are, I mean, very big in Brazil, flying to many gateways, and and we we are going to continue our partnership, our code share, and also the frequent flyer with them. Thank you. Our next question comes from Gabriel Rezende from Itaú BBA. Please, Mr. Gabriel, your microphone is open. Thank you. I have just a, a quick follow-up uh, regarding the, the delay to, to receive the aircraft from Boeing. So it is clear that you mentioned that you have uh, some grounded aircraft that are generating lease uh, expenses not tied to revenue generation, and that is waiting on your cash flow. And you mentioned that this should also wait on the the, the gas figures looking forward. Uh, I just like uh, I would just like to, to confirm that we should see maybe a spike on maintenance expenses in the coming quarters because of this effect. I mean, you're gonna have to to return these aircraft, do some maintenance, some, some work on them to to return them following your your checklist, and that we should see these these higher uh, maintenance expenses. Is that going to be one of the negative effects you're going to have because of these uh, idle capacity? Yeah, hi, hi, Gabriel. It's uh, as you can see in even in this quarter, which is a very robust uh, result that we are delivering. But it, it it has already the impact of four lease returns on the on the cost side, and that will probably continue as as we as we go. We are looking to every airplane, sit down with the lessor, and say, look, can we come bring those plane this plane back to the operation? Can we extend that lease? Can we invest in the right capex, invest on the engines and stay flying this NG or let's return? So we are doing this. And the the other moving piece is the delivers and that we have very low visibility so far. That's why it's something that we are managing in the like two month time frame rolling basis. So we, we go and say, look, those are the candidates to bring those planes back to fly. We sit down with the lessor try to have a negotiation to return or to make sure we can we can fly those airplanes or we we can take a max and return those planes the level of maintenance will continue to be uh impacting the the cost as we saw this quarter i don't think it's going to be much uh, bigger than what it was in the quarter but also there is uh, uh the the challenge on the capex side if we decide to return more planes the then to fulfill the gap on the delivers and that's what mario answered before we are budgeting 2024 to make sure that we have enough room to address those engines uh sit down with the source with mros to have more uh, ability to finance those capex that's what we are doing right now and working with new engine facilities especially with the brazilian government to make sure we can address a higher capex uh, than we usually face so cost and also capex will be impacted uh, especially in the next uh, 12 months 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, uh, Gabriel, uh, this, uh, the following. We, if you remember, we have been, uh, we provision, uh, you know, some of the return costs, uh, uh, the maintenance return costs in our balance sheet back in, by the end of 2021. So, uh, of course, part of that uh, impact is going to be compensated, uh, not all because, uh, you know, the provision is, uh, a pro is prorated as long as the cycles we're going to start to be constituted. Uh, so given that we we anticipated some of the redeliveries of the aircraft in 225 and 26, and now we are anticipating some of the returns as one of the big efforts that we're doing in order to uh, you know rebalance our fleet uh, and recover the efficiency and also the productivity. Uh, we we have been impacted by this higher uh, costs going forward, and at the same time, uh, the potential profits on on gains for the new deliveries. Uh, now we have some uncertainty, so that's been dri driving the results uh, to be uh, temporarily, uh, you know, uh, with the cost temporarily increase from what we previously forecasted. But uh, at the same time, what you probably can can think is that. At the same time, we are doing that uh, uh, effort in terms of reducing that idleness, and we can potentially uh, start to have some uh, impacts on, on the PL, on the maintenance line. At the same time, on the cash flow perspective, uh, as we mentioned before, you know, we are also paying uh, right now uh, some, some inefficient uh, drag related to leases. Uh, uh, with uh, no aircraft uh, available, we also we need to uh, perform into uh, additional leases for spare engines and maintenance reserves. So everything that in order to address uh, that impact on the maintenance going forward, we can expect that we can also uh, compensate or offset that, that cost impact going forward uh, with a lower drag in the cash flow. And at the same time, to have a more neutral scenario, uh, because we are we are fixing that that issue right now, right? So th that's only another way to think in terms of cash flow impact. That's very helpful. Thank you, guys. Our next question comes from Diego Villalobos from Moneda SA. Please, Mr. Diego, your microphone's open. Hi, good morning. Thanks for the time. Uh, I just want to follow up in the in the lessors topic. Could you update us on the situation with in the negotiations? Have, have there been any updates? And what are you seeing as the main bottlenecks? And and a second question is regarding the 2024 and 2025 maturities. What are you expecting to confront those? And are there any plans or there? Thanks. Good morning, Diego. So on the lessor side, we, we continue to talk with all the lessors. We have 25 lessors and to address, I mean, the, the accumulated liabilities that we have on the leasing side, most of them uh, are reflected as lease deferrals that we, we, of course, we are trying to negotiate to push them to the, to the right. And but also we are discussing with lessors now. I mean, how can we address the 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 end of leasing compensation of the the airplanes, especially the planes that we are not flying, uh, and also maintenance facilities that we are uh, discussing to how how can we address the engines? So I think no ourselves and the lessors we don't want to have planes on the ground here or any other places so we are going lesser by lesser especially with the ones that are, have this situation of engines and planes on the ground to make sure we can address a way and expedite the way without uh, a tremendous cash burn uh, all at once so the negotiations are uh, are improving we have i mean it takes time so we we have been this since uh, last year when we issued the esan it takes time, but we are, uh, I mean, we, we are making progress with them. Oh, Mario. Yeah, uh, for, for the second uh, question related to the outstanding amount on the bonds, Diego, uh, you know, as you know, the 2024 
we have already reduced the, the spring maturity risk. So now the outstanding amount is uh, below $42 million. And uh, that's, of course, has the, the shortest maturity in, in, the, in the middle of next year. And on the 25 and 26, there's still two years uh, into the, matur the material. So the, the, the point is that we are focused on now on putting the company back on track uh, in terms of operational profitability performance uh, and also that uh, resolving uh, most of that capacity uh, plus the, the, the CapEx uh, uh, issue that is something that if we can fix that, uh, company will be uh, behaving much better in terms of their uh, financial performance, right? Because uh, something that I wanted to highlight is that we are producing that EBIT and EBITDA generation, uh, even carrying this rack uh, uh, in our balance sheet. So, we, you know, we, we really understand that uh, with the you know, the efforts and this uh, very good work with our team, uh, we can really be outperforming our results when we have this uh, capex and capacity being, being addressed. So that, that's our main priority right now. And uh, of course, uh, if that's happened, we can turn it into higher margins, better cash flow. And uh, and when the scenario will happen, we will we'll drive to uh, all alternatives that Go has available uh, that we can access, uh, where is going to be the, the best way to uh, address all those 25 and 26 bonds. So th this is too far away right now. Of course, we try to to think what we can do uh, in some anticipation, uh, but this is not the top priority right now or neither the best use of cash at this point in time. So when the time is appropriate, of course, we're gonna be discussing that topic, uh, and right now, of course, all the alternatives are on the table. But uh, we need to put the the company back on track first. Otherwise, you know, uh, there's no room to discuss anything on the 25, 26 bonds, and the 24, as I mentioned, is is pretty much more uh, reduced as a risk, and, and that's something that we we also gonna be handle uh, when we. We, we can get into the 2023 results uh, uh, and start to look on 2024. 20, okay, great. Thanks.